here, I always have to do a special, a special shout out when there are, are people that grace us with their presence on a Monday. Well, I'm hoping to make it a bit more regular than I have in the last year, but. Uh... Very cool. Thank you. And you're, are you in uh, Toronto today? The to beer. <laughs> Did you see me look around? Yes, I no. am. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. If you have to yeah. search Where the surroundings I? to see what's, what country you're in. He's so. not sure even now. If you smell the Canadian bacon, then you know you're <laughs> maple syrup. Yeah. Well, travel travel has started. So it is yeah. um, as, as of March, end of February. So it's like, it, it really depends typically. So the reason even when I started doing Mondays was it's like, okay, typically I know that I will be stationary and i will not be in the air stationary where is a different story so <laughs> yeah once you get to tuesday wednesday yeah life of travel i don't miss it yeah at least you're not at the stage where you have to look down at the wall plugs <laughs> see which <laughs> which part of the world you're in right yeah. right next year we'll see I'll use a bill word that would make you highly peripatetic. Ooh. I don't have change for that $4 word. <laughs> it's adjacent to my paranormal paraglider. I just call myself parapathetic. Yes. Hmm. Let's start Googling these words. That's the next Ghostbusters movie, the paranormal paraglider. I don't know if they're going to get another one out because they didn't really like the last one. And the one before that was even worse. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's the sequelitis that sometimes works and sometimes really doesn't. Who am I kidding? Well, I watched one every single one of the better. franchise. I think uh, sequels work better with books than movies overall. Yeah. After all, it is show business. Mm. It's when they shoot the sequel at the same time they do the main movie. That makes sense. You're saved already set a lot up. Of, yeah, saved a lot of money for Back to the Future 2 and 3. Mm. Did they shoot those back to back? They did, yeah. Oh, didn't know that. Didn't they do that with Avatar? At least parts of it? Oh, it was uh, Lord of the Rings. Sorry. Lord of the Rings. And a reminder to the panel to feel free to raise your hands early on some of these questions so it'll help the back end team and me, kind of, sort of.
Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. Our first hour, we answer your questions on media and digital productions. And our second hour is something that we typically want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be speaking with Cindy Drozda on the business of wood turning and how you build community around a niche topic just like that. And speaking of topics, Bill, let's get into these questions. Absolutely. Uh, our first one comes from Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. And Bo says, I have a collection of Canon EF lenses. What's a good stable adapter to get them to my Sony E-mount camera? Looking for a reasonable cost, but solid auto-focusing capability. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, Bo, there's a few of them out there. The one I run across the most is the Metabones. And just before showtime, I called my uh, buddy who works at a uh, rental house in Philly and I said, uh, any gotchas on the Metabones? He just says that uh, with the Sony autofocus, it's just not quite as snappy as it would with a GM lens on it. But for the most part, Metabones is the way to go. Alex? Yep, we've used the Metabones for a long time. So that, that's definitely been the converter that we've used typically. One of the challenges that we get into is sometimes it will fit very, very tightly, especially with the Blackmagic cameras. We, we, we converted EFs to four thirds. And we haven't had as much trouble with the Sonys, but this was a long time ago, maybe a decade ago, when we started buying Metabones. But that's all we've bought for those conversions, and they've worked really well. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas is up next. Would you get the OC White Limited Edition Pro Boom Ultima Gen 2 Ultra Low Profile Adjustable Mic Boom with the 12 inch <laughs> riser in black or red? Pros and cons vis-a-vis -vis uh, other mic booms. The, the power of cut and paste. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so Go much ahead, easier to do Jake. than to say. <laughs> Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, well, the, here it is in black, and it works really well. I, I don't think the color is going to affect its performance at all. And um, yeah, you got the money. They're pretty cool. Mitchell? Yeah, for years in the radio business, O.C. White ruled the uh, the world. And it was that big transition between using the, uh, the risers that had springs in them uh, anything that doesn't have a spring has some kind of a torsion system that low profile works really well. The only part of it is I don't understand why you would put a 12 inch riser on a low profile uh, microphone arm because it just simply raises it at a higher level. Um, and I'm not sure in the question is the way it's written the, the riser in black or red or the whole thing, but whatever. Um, I would consider that uh, uh, an optional piece to go with. And if you want to step up to something even better than that, um, consider the Yellow Tech Mika, M-I-K-A. They've got everything, and they're very expensive. And Alex? Are the Mikas underslung or overslung? I don't think I've ever seen an underslung Mika. Both. Both. Oh, okay. They have them all. They have underslung, overslung, pole-mounted. Yeah, lights, okay. Yeah, I haven't action. seen them. Yeah, I haven't seen the Mika's. Uh, I've only seen over overslung ones. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I'd get anything with a limited edition, given that the only part you ever see is this part right here. So I don't know why I would do a limited edition, but I do have the underslung uh, OC White, and um, it's a it's a great arm. The reason that you have that riser is so that you can put um, more than one mic arm on that riser. So that's a center pipe that goes up the center, and you can put three or four of them and hang them all out so that you can have a bunch of people talking to each other. So that's typically the reason that those risers are, are used. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, uh, this one has a just a horizontal moving arm first and then a second arm that goes up and down. Yep. Uh, just be sure you have enough room to get your hands if you're going to put your mic in front of you if underslung and you want it out of the shot. Uh, make sure you have enough room to get your hands onto the keyboard if your keyboard's in front of you. So that's a consideration with those that don't have an arm that goes up and then down. It comes across and then up. So make sure you have enough arm room for keyboards. Mitchell? Another quick feature to look for is the weight of the microphone you're going to put on it because some uh, heavier mics like that U87 you see hanging behind me can be a problem. And when you get near the edge of being too heavy, the mic won't always steadily remain in the right spot. It will drift. Uh, that OC White has a lockable rotation and setting on it, so you can adjust um, how much it uh, it grabs. And Alex? 
Yeah, I definitely, I have to tune the setting for every one of, and any different mic I put in, I sit there and I, it's got a little hex wrench, you sit there and, and uh, make the adjustment to it. Um, the, what, the other thing that I, I would highly recommend for any underslung mic is I actually have mine attached to another table, not the table I'm working on. So I have a table that is about, uh, it's about eight inches higher than the table that I have here and I have it attached over there. And that means I don't get any vibration. So I don't, you don't, you never hear anything uh, from me tapping on my, so the, when you attach it to the same, when you t attach, any mic, but especially an underslung mic, to the same table that you're talking into, you have a much higher chance of having, um, you know, impact um, stuff. Even if it's, you know, it, this one's sitting in a um, in in a shock mount, but it, you still may hear some of it. Next question. Next one comes to us from Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. How does the Tele, uh, Teletonka line of routers stack up to Peplink? Alex. I don't know yet, but it's very interesting. I haven't heard of it until until Bo kindly asked about it, uh, but now I'm going to be researching it. So uh, these look like um, basically ruggedized versions of what we what we've seen with PepWave uh, in the past or PepLink, and um, and oh, and some that are not ruggedized, but they um, basically will take multiple SIMs as well as Ethernet as well as other things. It doesn't. My glance over doesn't seem to have all the features that I'm used to with the PepLink with some of the antennas and some of the Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. Um, but it, it, I may, I've only looked at it for <laughs> a couple minutes. So, um, so stay tuned on that. And, uh, but it looks like a really interesting piece of hardware. Go ahead, Bill. Well, if you're listening to the show rather than watching, just wanted to know, I kind of mispronounced that pretty badly. If you're looking it up, it's Teltonica. It looks like T-E-L-T-O-N-I-K-A, just for those of you who might be listening. Next question. Uh, John Foltz, Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. Pass keys on Apple devices. Has anyone on the panel used them? What's your mileage been? Are pass keys the future? Go ahead, Bill. I think biometrics are the future. What I'm finding is more and more I'm spending less and less time worrying about passwords because most of my Apple devices at least uh, do facial ID. And once that's in there, it knows it's me. And I'm having to fiddle with more, with less and less of remembering uh, complicated passwords, and I'm really glad for that. Alex? Yeah, passkeys are actually connected to your biometrics. So you're, you can't use a passkey without biometrics. And so um, it is the that step towards it. Um, I don't believe that they can, um, you know, all of them are designed and Apple's doing it as well as uh, Google is there. This is really that they are the future. They're not probably very much of the present at the moment. Um, the step towards that has been using biometrics to insert a password, which is, you know, how, what Bill was describing there. And Apple has been doing that for a couple of years. But the next step forward is going to be pass keys. And the big thing about pass keys is that num number one, it'll make it a lot easier to get into things, but it'll also make it much, much harder for people to jump into things that aren't there to, that are coming from a device that they don't own. So you, you, you have to know that your pass keys, what'll probably end up happening is it'll come back to your phone the way that some other, like, for instance, if you log into YouTube from a new computer, it'll say, Hey, go to YouTube and give me the number that you see here. What, you know, whatever that is, uh, and that's two-factor authentication to another application. Um, and so what you're probably going to end up having to do in, in the future is you'll get to a website on your computer that doesn't have passkey, but it'll ask you to open up your phone. But what that's going to ensure over time, um, it's going to be much, 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 much harder for someone to get your passwords and have get it anywhere with them <laughs> because because everything is going to get tied back to that. It's also going to be much harder to be an anonymous. You know, like it's, it is... Because, you know, it's not that you won't be able to go to things that are anonymous. It's just that everything that matters will not be anonymous. And everything that matters, you know, all these companies will just be like, well, we don't want to deal with that anymore. And so um, so just being able to trade passwords to other people and so on and so forth will get harder and harder and harder as they as it gets more and more tied into your face, your iris, your, um, you, know, all, you know, all the different, your, th your uh, thumbprint, et cetera. Yeah, Paul mentions in the chat that he agrees and he he added the the iris, the eyeball part, which makes me think of minority report for those of you who remember the, that. Yeah, the, the iris is a pretty, uh, it's very, very unique. It's actually, your iris is actually much more unique than uh, uh, than your thumbprint, um, you know, or it's much more, and it's much, much more for many people easier to identify. It depends on what color your, your eyes are. Um, but, uh, but, and we, we've been working on, I mean, somebody has been working on iris technology for a long time. So you can, um, there are devices that can ID you with a very, very high precision, uh, through precision sunglasses at about four feet. 
<laughs> like so, so once you get within those, uh, w- once you get in with that, they can, it, they're pretty good at, at, at identifying you through your iris. And so uh, those are, that technology, we haven't put into phones yet, but it's probably coming. Next question. Courtney Gooden and from Hollywood here on the panel, when, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, Apple has banned their employees from using chat GPT. Is this a wise move? And he's got a Mac rumors site there. Go ahead, John. Over abundance of caution, several companies have have made this policy because employees, flippant employees, have been putting trade secrets and sensitive information into OpenAI, including code. And all of that stuff is saved by OpenAI. So they've done this as a as a precautionary um, move. Alex, yeah, I'm. You know, I think that uh, it 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 doesn't make. You know, you have to be very careful, especially a company like Apple that's breaking new ground. And when you're working on the code, it's very. You know, you you are pushing into an external source. I mean, you know, I think that Apple's probably one of the most sensitive commercial companies. There's obviously lots of organizations that are sensitive to this, of taking um, data that it needs, needs to stay secret and putting it into something that is not part of your company. So I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense for Apple to do that. Um, I think that, you know, you'll, a lot of the, it doesn't mean that they can't be at home doing things on their own and doing, you know, they're not banned from using chat GPT just for work. Um, and I think most companies should probably think about that. You know, obviously what's going to happen over time is uh, companies will build their own version of AI that will be internal to the company. So it'll it'll reference everything inside the company. It will stay on servers inside the company and it'll answer your questions inside the company. And it won't be as robust as the one that is using the entire internet, but it will still be very good and it won't um, spill out any any extra information. Courtney? Yeah, I don't know the wisdom of this. It sounds like the marketing department interfering with the engineering department because they're paranoid of leaks. Uh, they could just ban the employees from uploading anything into chat GPT, but then I guess the prompts um, are public, are, are available. So if you find somebody saying, write me some code that works on an iPhone 17, you know, they people would that might leak out. Oh my God! People would know that there's another iPhone coming out. Oh, they would they would get upset. Alex, Apple's also very uh, attached to their patents, and the ownership of uh, code driven by ChatGPT is unknown. So I think that um, I think that Apple would probably not want ChatGPT generating code for it just yet. And then also, like in, when you use ChatGPT, it also has a disclaimer that for quality assurance, like people are reviewing this. So not even just in the database, like you just don't even don't even know who else is having access to that proprietary information. And I do see that Vic mentioned, like embrace it, learn it, use it to your benefit. However, in this context, it's trade secrets. Trade secrets are being shared um, as well. Courtney. Well, once patents are granted, they're public. So I don't know how that would uh, patent pending. But what you have, what what do you own? Like you know, you have to talk about the reference and where it came from, and and being able to patent something or copyright something, you know, that's coming from AI is still an unknown thing. You know, like whether oh, that's. Oh, I, I see the result of something. Yeah, yeah the result. Worried about is, future lawsuits. I yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I made a new name. I made new name supers in Resolve. They work fine on my Mac and also in the PC in rehearsal. But when we're streaming it, it does this. It sees 12 minutes in and he's got a link. Is this Wirecast, Resolve, or the PC? Go ahead, Alex. I think it's Wirecast. <laughs> that's a playback issue. So that's a, um, and probably it's because I, I bet you that if you had another computer streaming, while you're running Wirecast. So have Wirecast pass its HDMI out to another computer with Wirecast and have it stream it. But what you're ha- what I think is happening there is that the streaming is taking up too much CPU or GPU and the graphics are no longer able to play out. So the reason that it's working in rehearsal is because you're not streaming. Um, as soon as you turn the streaming on, you're using a lot more CPU and it's, uh, and it's not able to do both the CPU and the lower third at the same time. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Could a productized version of the Office Hours 2.0 platform be beneficial for building community connection and engagement in education? And he's thinking particularly of K through 12, where it would have many useful use cases. Alex? Yeah, we're thinking pretty hard about that. Um, you know, I think that the uh, one of the things that we're um, going to be focusing on this, this, this is the first step towards this. 
as we've had a lot of shows inside of office hours, but usually they use their own pipelines. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not really using the OH pipeline. So uh, we're going to try um, building uh, a show around dis uh, around um, accessibility. And that's going to take the space on Saturdays of um, of the education hour because the educators take the summer off. Um, so that accessibility is going to be there. But if it is successful, um, then in the fall, that would probably be a show on its own that probably is not in the normal time frame, and uh, and that will sit. If, if everything works well inside of the pipeline. So what, what we're looking at is starting to experiment with people doing shows that are just using the OH pipeline as opposed to building a show on a new pipeline, um, which means that we have a bunch of people that already know how to use it. <laughs> so, and a system that we are, that we're, that's in current development. So, um, so we're gonna experiment with that. Um, but I think that, you know, the goal of course is to make it more, you know, more widely available to more people to have these kinds of conversations. Are there like specific shows that you're thinking about or it's more so just to, use the pipeline and, and test and office hours is a, you know, it's not office hours for graphics or media. It's just office hours. It's um, we have a bunch of thinkers that, that know some things, all of us know our own little parts of this puzzle and we're openly sharing ideas or, or, and answering questions um, that could be done for just about anything. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, so, so almost anything could be a, a discussion like this. Um, and we've, you know, refined it and figured it out here. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to make it more available. I, I think that what will happen is eventually um, we'll have people within our community that want to use that pipe, use the pipeline that we're using right now. So one of the things that we have to figure out is how do we pivot the pipeline to um, so that it's, you know, it looks like office hours in the morning, but later in the morning, it looks like something else. And later in the morning, it looks like something else. Another thing is looking at, you know, all the hardware and figuring out, you know, how do we replicate this to another, to build another instance of it. So both for resiliency, but so that we could run more than one show at one time. And then, you know, in the 2024, 2025 range, uh, you know, how do we move it into the cloud? And so as you, but we're, but what we're, what we're figuring out right now is, how do we have these conversations and what do we need on the back end like Makana and what do we need on the front end? All those things are things that we're, you know, refining here, um, but we can make them, you know, a, a, over time more available to, uh, you know, to a lot of other communities that might want to do the same thing. Next question. Next one comes from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, everyone. I'm considering using a Blackmagic Multiview 4 to output to a large monitor using the Thunderbolt outs on a studio. How would the panel recommend converting the Thunderbolt to SDI workflow with minimal conversions or latency? Thanks. Jason? Oh, this used to be much easier with just a Duo 2 and a nice little piece of software that hasn't been updated for the M1 Mac. Uh, I'll show you the, the lazy and, and kind of annoying way to do it. You can take, you know, any sort of conversion. This one's from uh, OWC that has HDMI and then take HDMI to a Blackmagic converter and then there's your SDI. But uh, that is a lot of conversion. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas up next. Most Zoom meetings are total chaos in contrast to the perfection of office hours. How can the Zoom interface itself learn from office hours and get participants centered with good audio? Mitchell? Well, both of those things we do very well. We use the uh, Fenwick Framer that gets our heads in the right spot to uh, do our super sourcing uh, and uh, the WLM meters. So wouldn't it be nice to have a WLM meter as one of the accessories working inside of Zoom? I've talked to my friends over at Waves and I've made the suggestion, so I don't know if they're in touch, but that would be great. Go ahead, John. It easily be added as an app. Skype used to have a great thing where you could call in and it would it would play your audio back. So if people get immediate feedback of how they looked and sounded, and and then contrast contrast that against people that that look good like Alex or Bill or and show them and and then turn off all virtual backgrounds. Get rid of those completely. <laughs> Harshid. I say try to be more practical. So go in and dive in and show the audio settings because some people don't understand what original music, uh, original sound for musician is on or off and what optimized might be. So giving the end user that uh, understanding from the get go, if they're brand new to the product, uh, you could have it as a skip tutorial if you don't need it kind of thing. But it's great to have that at least so that the audio quality doesn't suffer later on down the pipeline. Uh, most people 
do keep their audio on the optimized H uh, sound and that re removes all the background. But whenever you play music or anything else, uh, a lot of your music gets chopped up because it's the original sound is not turned on and they feel they had a great presentation. They were excited. They went, did excellent, but then none of what they were trying to play came through. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah. So it's a complicated problem <laughs> that, that we've that we've developed over time. Uh, it's not just the the audio and video quality. I mean, I, I think those are things that are, are definitely important. But it's the fact that we have a bunch of panelists who have done this a whole bunch of times, and they are you know we've figured out best practices over you know over a thousand times we've done this, and so so there's best practices. Uh, also, the panelists and the and the hosts often have a lot of experience in doing this because we've done anywhere from uh, tens to hundreds to over a thousand appearances. And so you get into a, a zone of that. And then of course, this, the, the interface that we have on the back end makes it uh, is transformational. <laughs> so like, like I, you can't run you can't run office hours uh, without without Makan on the back end. Like it's it's not like it was some version of chaos. It was it ordered chaos um, before it, but after it, it's been it's been a much cleaner, it's much cleaner. And I, I have to admit, uh, because of office hours, I really don't go to anybody else's Zooms. Like I don't, I can't, I can't watch it. It's like just watching a train wreck for me um, because I don't really want to watch lecturing. I don't really want to, you know, it, it, you can't have an open conversation because everyone's just jumping on top of each other and, and, uh, and it's a lot of bad audio and bad video. And, and I have to admit that I've become so used to this that uh, even when we have a guest on that is not used to what we do, um, that hasn't been part of this, I find it to be even in our own show somewhat painful. So, so it's something that we have to, that we're trying to figure out is how to prep the guests better. So they really understand what, how this works, because uh, it, it, it really um, it throws a wrench into the, into the whole pipeline when we, when we, when we bring someone in that doesn't understand it, or more importantly, two or three people who don't understand how to use the, the tools that we've built. Bill? So it was an interesting thing for me. I, you know, I spending a lot of my time behind a camera through the beginning of my career. The framing that we use in office hours is one of the last I would have gone to before I got involved with the show because a centered talking head with no uh, visual attention to uh, thirds and 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 framing and alternate framings was something that I tried to avoid. I worked against. When I got here and I realized what was happening and why it was happening, I had to change all my thinking and said, no, this is right. Because the the way people experience this is a variety of people and they all have to be given equal weight, equal time. There's the issue of the lower thirds and the super sources and the rest of that. All of that that is making this exactly right for this use. But for me, unlearning how to put someone camera left so that it was a more balanced picture with the background was something I really had to rethink. I, this is a new environment and it needs new rules. And I'm happy that Alex has helped us understand why those new rules were the important words, rules that helped this format succeed. Todd? Uh, yeah, so kind of opposite of Bill, I've just been in front of the camera the last couple of years and Zoom. Uh, so it's been an evolution in for me in office hours has really been where I've learned all this stuff and this setup and, um, you know, starting from a webcam, a C920 on my desktop and a window in the background that blows me out to changing and adding lighting and, a you know, good camera and a setup. I'm now able to kind of stand out as, as a co-host for a lot of Cindy's demos and stuff like that. So. And it's a, I think it's a, a personal choice, uh, you know, how, how you want to look, you know, uh, laptops up the nose, not a good look. Uh, we see that a lot in the wood turning demos. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be an evolution for people as they go through and, and grow and learn to communicate this way uh, more and more. So uh, even teaching my own daughter has been difficult. You know, she's just <laughs> give me a webcam. I don't really care. Uh, but that's changing. That's changing. So I think it's an evolution. And for our producers, this is a great time for you to go ahead and submit your questions for this hour or even getting ready for our second hour as we head back into these questions. Alex? Yeah, and all I was going to say is that, you know, I, I, what I find amazing is people who 
think about like what color tie they're wearing because of a client or a, the kind of suit or what kind of car they drive or, you know, how they do their hair, all those, they, they pay attention to all those things because they know that they make a difference in how they a- occur for the person that they're talking to will then just open up their laptop and jump into it. Into a, and, and I think that I will say that it, part of this is, uh, I don't know, Part of this is the companies who make those video co- conferencing software. I won't single any of them out, but almost all of them do this. What they want you to feel like is you can just open it up and have it. It's easy, you know. And and we used to we used to joke. I used to do a lot of hangouts, you know, for Google. And we and and Google always wanted it to feel like it was just like we just we just opened this up, started talking, you know. And we used to send back ha- like these pictures of a half million dollars of hardware feeding into a hangout <laughs> and we and we'd always just caption it love like because hangouts are easy you know and and so um and so the thing is is that uh the i think it's so important for people to understand that it's like everything else if you want to project you are going to pay attention to what shirt you're going to wear and what and and you know how you hold yourself and how you do those things and the people who don't pay attention to those things don't move forward you know like you know they, they these things ma- matter and uh, and the new one that matters is how we appear on Zoom. <laughs> so, so it's it's important to, uh, for people. And, and we hope to keep on being kind of a, uh, an example of what's possible if we, if we go down that path, you know. Next question. Todd Raines is up next from Allen, Texas. Has anyone had issues with screen sharing in Zoom on an M1 Mac mini, uh, particularly M1 Mac mini, running Display Link Manager? It crashed on me the other night. Todd, you want to explain a little more? Uh, yeah, so I was actually uh, doing a demo, and right near the end of the demo, um, I was screen sharing, uh, and the Mac popped up a little modal asking uh, for permission to share the screen. So I had to type in my uh, system password, and as soon as I did that, I think Display Link and you know Mac Displays decided to uh, change whatever, and it ended up kind of locking me out of of changing anything on the Mac. Uh, it was almost like it was just frozen. And uh, I think now looking back at it, I finally, I thought I had bricked the Mac. It was uh, kind of crazy. Uh, couldn't do anything with it. So I'd really had to shut down the Zoom meeting right then. Um, but I think what happened is it, it changed my third display to instead of extend to a mirror. And I just couldn't get out of that. Uh, the ATEM software was, you know, I couldn't reach the actual physical buttons, and so I couldn't do anything. It was, I don't know if any of this display link, is there an order in which the you have to use the HDMI um, socket on the Mac Mini as your main display, or can that be into the display link um, sonnet box or OWC box, whatever it is, pluggable? Go ahead, Alex. Is. So uh, I will say that I am very reticent to doing anything creative with my production outputs. You know, like, like you know, the, I mean, I think that that's the thing that I would say there is that um, I will usually limit my production to what I can do inside of the way the hardware is built. And so I got some of the pluggables to kind of play with and I had enough, are you using a pluggable? Is that what you're using for the? Uh, it's a, um, I think it's a, it's a site like a pluggable. It's a, you know. Um, and it's the design to give you more displays. Two, two HDMI out. Yeah. I would be, you know, I think that, um, I will say that I, I would, I would probably not, I, I, I've played with them enough where I just went, I don't know if these are stable enough to use in production. Like I, I don't, you know, and I try to figure out, you know, how am I going to use what I can't, what the, the computer is built for. Um, and, and I think that they, the problem really is, is they, they work 95% of the time. It's just that the 5% is what you stepped into. Mm-hmm. And for me, if I, if I, if I think that they're not going to work 99.9999% of the time, I, you know, and, and it doesn't mean that nothing happens. I mean, I still have my computers do funky things. I, I figured out that if you um, plug a display, if you use this USB-C to, or Thunderbolt to video, and you don't have something in the HDMI, it puts your Mac mini into like a world that you can't find anything. So you have to have something in the HDMI or, or it gets lost. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that, you know, that, that it can still happen, but I will say that a Mac mini, I think, you know, for a variety of reasons was built for two outputs. You know, and I think that I would strongly recommend the the way to get other things out of there is potentially using something like a decklink card with a, you know, like so you can push things out of it rather than trying to push that system a little bit further. Um, We've had a lot of partners that have had problems with display link style things, the the pluggables specifically. Um, Again, 
for some people, when they don't change their system at all and they never do anything different and they never, you know, and it just works, as long as they don't change anything, they don't do any updates, they don't do any moves, they don't do anything else, it, it seems to work okay. Um, but it, and, and some people go, well, every once in a while it does something weird. And I'm like, okay, well, that's why I don't want to use it. So I don't, I don't want every once in a while for it to do something weird, you know? And so, so I think that that's the, the concern I would have with any of these pieces of hardware. I totally get that you have more out, you need more outputs than what you have, but I'd be very careful about, about stretching it. What I tend to do is, I mean, and I know this is not the, the option for everybody, but I just buy another Mac mini. Like I'm going to do, if I'm going to do something else, I'm going to have another one. And I try to find cheap ones now because they're cheap ones floating around. Um, because the, anything with an M1 on it will will work pretty well, um, but but um, but I'd be very careful of putting putting the display link technology. It's not really built for production video production. It's built for your computers when you're managing the stock market trades or whatever. And if it does something funky, it does it. But you're you're pushing your computer a lot harder than the way people who use display link typically use it. Courtney. Yeah, Alex is dancing all around it. I think uh, the problem is these display link uh, e extra monitors uh, create a since they're cross platform, they their drivers create a virtual video card, and so it takes the data out of the USB bus, creates a virtual video card, and so the video RAM that it's using to display is created in a virtual area of your computer. And I think probably what you're running into, I don't know for sure, but on the M1, it's Zoom is looking to try and capture, pull that data directly from the video RAM. And if that RAM moves by you uh, agreeing on something or allowing it to do something, it could move that video buffer. And once it moves that video buffer, then you can crash your computer. So I would advise against using any kind of pluggable or anything that uses a virtual video card and trying to to uh, output that to Zoom as a uh, screen share or anything because it may not be finding the video where it last left it. So uh, use the the it should be fine to screen share from your uh, HDMI output, but I wouldn't do it uh, if you're running a virtual a virtual video card like a pluggable. Next question. Next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Can you compare the impact on our society of robotics versus artificial intelligence and robots running on AI? John? Not quite sure what you're asking here, Paul, but robotics have been running for decades in manufacturing everywhere, increased productivity. And then if you watch anything that Elon does with Optimist, you know that the same AI platform that they're using for full self-driving is going to be used on Optimus. So that image recognition engine and that model that he's building with 6 million cars out there, building that model is just got him light years ahead of all the other automobile manufacturers. And so all those models will be running on, on the robots in the future. Go ahead, Jason. Traditionally, I, I'll, I'll go with the the last part, traditionally what robotics use is not what we're calling AI here. Um, they use what's called fuzzy logic, and that's as close as they get to some sort of deviation from programming that is that is learning. You know, if you think of it like a bullet train, instead of having very specific settings in the throttle, it's more like, well, if you're a little bit too fast, then turn it down a little bit. If you're a little bit too slow, then turn it up a little bit. Um, th that's that's really prior to to this kind of AI revolution. That's that's what we meant. And um, as far as accessibility, all it takes for for ChatGPT is a web browser. That's that's a big difference. Robotics was never a cheap endeavor. Go ahead, Bill. So for me, robotics displaces physical labor. Uh, AI displaces intellectual labor. Robots running on AI disrupts everything. Alex. Yeah, I think that one thing, I was thinking about something similar to what Bill was just talking about. I was reading something on tw Twitter a lot over the weekend, I don't know, and I realized that most people on Twitter are, are, are in the kind of the intellectual world as opposed to the physical world. So ro robots have been replacing people for a long time. And no one thought, no one on Twitter thought it was a big deal and said it in, in, until AI pointed towards them <laughs> like and said, I am now going to build a robot that will replace you, you know? And, and so, um, and so I think that, uh, I think the challenge really is exactly what Bill said is that AI is now taking what is mundane tasks and what, what will become more and more complex tasks 
and um, and you know making them something that is uh, you know automatic and something that it can actually build on. And so I think that that is something we have to you know look at. And I think that the one of the things, but I don't think it replaces you know like there's a lot of we're, we're talking about wood turning uh, later later today. Um, what what Cindy and Todd do, I think, is very different than what you, when you buy a something that just comes out of a factory. You know, so what the robot does is not the creation. It's not the creative spark that a human adds to it. And I don't think it will anytime soon. I think that the folks that are at the very top end of that process are always going to have a place to, to go. The problem we really get into is that we're not, we take the most valuable time uh, is K through 12. When kids are, when kids are that age, they're the most plastic, they absorb the most, and we cannot waste their time with teaching them things that they don't need. You know, we need to teach them exactly what they need and give them a lot of room so they can start doing what they love very early on because we don't want to waste 10 years of their time between eight and 18, you know, learning how to do things that they're never going to use again. We have to focus on what do they absolutely need to know and then allow them to express themselves over those 10 years and reach some level of mastery by the time they get out of high school, you know, and that's going to be something that's going to be a huge transformation that we're going to see coming. But, but it, we have to allow humans to develop the things that make them special much earlier on than what we're doing right now to compete with what's about to happen. Next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. For mobile workflows that involve space-hungry sample libraries, would you rather have all your libraries on an internal larger SSD or have your most frequently used libraries on an internal SSD and the rest on an external SSD? Go ahead, Jason. In a perfect world, I'll answer the question exactly as asked. Of course, I would want every sample library I've ever had to be on an internal SSD. And, and for everything else, you know, OWC makes these relatively affordable. Let's see, this is um, the Envoy Pro EX. Um, I think Alex has the newer version of that. And they are, in, they are insanely fast and they work really well. So that's, that's my second. Alex? I don't put libraries on my computer because I don't know when I'm gonna move them to some other, somewhere else where I wanna do stuff. I want everything, I want my scratch drives, I want everything on an external drive because if your scratch, if your computer runs out of space, your mail will fail, your iCal will fail, your like all kinds of other things fail very quickly if you run out of space. And so you don't wanna be writing to it or, or adding to it. Um, and you wanna, in my opinion, you wanna to try to keep everything on an external. Now, I, when I'm doing little jobs, I'll have stuff on my internal drive. But when I'm working, I have everything that I need sitting on an external drive. So if that computer goes down, I immediately pull that external drive with the libraries, with everything I need. I plug it into a new computer. I relink them and off I go. And I've done that, you know, with Resolve, with uh, Logic, with Final Cut. It's so much easier when you can just move them, um, you know, or send them in to, to be fixed. You, your core content is not being attached there and you're not spending a week trying to figure out how to get it off. Um, so I would recommend doing most of your work with stuff on your external drive. It's one of the reasons I keep my drive so small on my computer is to force me to do that. I, I only regret it on the Mac Studio because the drive is so fast, you know. So, um, so I do use it for. I, I would if I did a Mac Studio, I would put eight terabytes in, but I wouldn't put. I wouldn't waste that space with libraries. I would use it as my scratch drive for you know doing production because it's five uh, gigs a second, and so you want your video files to be in that in that area. Next question. Joe Kidd from the Bay Area in California. Mute me, a low-cost capacitive mute button offers compelling features at a low price point. Proprietary software powers the underlying audio routing. Has the panel heard of or had experience with this uh, using it with the office hours workflow? Mitchell? Ah, uh, the mute me. Well, I've spent thousands on muting because I'm here on office hours and I do a lot of reading. Um, here's the problem to mute me and I have owned it. Um, is it sounds like a good idea. It seems like one of those Kickstarter things you get excited about and you buy it and then you find out, oh, there's some problems. The capacitive uh, switching on it, for one thing, means that it only works about 80% of the time, if that. Um, the other part is that um, it, it's, it doesn't light up quite enough to make sense as an on-ear light. What you really need, Joe, is a tactile switch of some kind one that clicks or somehow lets you rest your finger on it so you can go to it quickly without having to hit a mouse button or a, uh, a fast key on your keyboard. Um, Alex and I use the uh, uh, the Sound Devices uh, 205. Uh, it has a nice big button on it that lights up. Here you go. 
And Mitch is at Sound Devices. I think that's Studio Technologies. Oh, sorry. Just studio didn't want to send them in the wrong direction. One of those companies, uh, my finger rests on it, and I can click it very quickly. The problem with the capacitance is that you have to stab it to be able to get it to work. So um, it's a good idea, good question, bad device. Alex? I have one, and I, I, I don't know if I'd say it's a bad device. It might be useful for some folks, but I had the same failure rate. Um, not, not quite 20%, but probably 5 or 10%, and that's enough. That was enough for me to go, well, this isn't going to really work for me. So that's been the problem is, is that the software-based ones. I think that there's a lot of things that could be done. I think we should keep, keep our eye on this, uh, on this space. I think that there's some interesting things that could happen here. Um, but, uh, but I think that um, uh, the, these hardware, these Bluetooth or wireless hardware systems, external uh, I haven't been super su successful enough to want to use them. And so you can get ones that are much less expensive. Bill, what do you have? You you have? A, I have the Rolls mic mute, yeah. the MS. Uh, here, I've got an extra one because I always have a spare. Uh, the and MS 111. No, this is like 30 or 40 bucks, I think. And it yeah. has two XLRs in and out and a simple button that is tactile. And as Mitch was saying, you can put your finger next to it and know immediately whether the mode is on or off. So yeah, that's what I so, use. So I think that there's a lot of other options there. And I would, I would really go towards a hardware option as opposed to a software one. Next question. Vic Hernandez is up next from Springfield, Missouri in the USA. My video conferencing experience has been all corporate. Uh, has been corporate. I now use the MV7. My iPhone 12 is my web camera and a couple of softboxes. Anything else you can think of that would help? Go ahead, Alex. I mean, the only thing to think about is what you're putting in your ears. I mean, you didn't list that, so you might already have something. But, you know, some kind of in-ear monitor uh, works really well. Uh, a lot of us like the Linsoul. You know, I think the SZ10s uh, are, are about 40 to $50. And a lot of us have been using those um, as a relatively. The important thing is, is that I, I used to use an in-ear, you know, kind of a typical IFB in-ear. And that's great when you're getting commands from a, you know, from your director and, and you're getting feedback on it. But when you're actually doing your own work by yourself, I think that something with more resolution is really important. And the reason for that is that you can hear when things are wrong with your own space. So um, I hear very, very small tones, uh, little things that I'm, noise that I'm making that other people may hear. Um, and I can, uh, I can hear it much clearer because of the, I, when I first put these on after going from an, a typical IFB, I almost couldn't be in, a, in, in office hours because I was hearing all of this stuff. And then I realized I had to hear that because I was pushing that all back into, into Zoom. And uh, it was important to not, not have that there. Jason? Yeah, um, I'll just give you a few more options as far as IFBs are concerned. These are Shure SE846s. These are probably a little bit more pricey than you need to go. Uh, Sennheiser, the one I'm wearing right now, um, these are inexpensive and they sound great. Alex's are insanely sensitive. So, I mean, it, it really, it, it just depends on, uh, on, on kind of uh, your tolerance and how much self-monitoring you, you need. And I was going to mention this, and I see John in the chat says as well, he said an ATEM if you don't have one and a small prompter. And Vic also mentions that he has the, uh, the IEMs. So the, that's what he's using for his in-ears. Todd, what would you like to add? Um, so I'm, I'm wearing the, uh, uh, the Lin Soles as well. But I want to mention that uh, I bought these adapters, the Bluetooth adapters for the Lin Soles, the Lin Sole AZ09s. And uh, if I open this up, hopefully I don't uh, connect them, but they're basically a, uh, a Bluetooth connection that you stick Lin Soles on the, on, the, on the back of. So for wireless connectivity, when we're at the lathe, I don't want any wires hanging around uh, my back and stuff like that. My mic pack goes down my shirt, but I wear these uh, Bluetooth ones when I'm turning at the lathe or we need to be mobile. So, uh, great little adapter, make it a Bluetooth for the linsoles. And for our producers, this is also a great time for you to vote up and down on the questions that we have listed in Mukana, because you do know the show is driven by you and your questions. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas is up next. What do you find useful to, uh, to store your gear? Shelves, cardboard boxes, plastic bins, plastic zip bags, toolboxes, and so forth. Alex? So many things. <laughs> Storage is, is, uh, is, is what um, 
a, a lot of my shelves are all Uline. Um, so Uline wire shelves is something that I use a lot of. Um, uh, there are less expensive versions and they're all pretty cheaply made. So my garage has all, the, I, I went ahead and bought the cheaper ones for my garage and I find myself in a, in a, um, you know, they they just feel a little rickety. So, so the Uline wire shelves are a little bit, a little bit heavier. Um, also the other thing that I use a lot from Uline are the variety of bin storage. So if you go to their bin storage, bin organizers is what you want to look for. And I have hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of these little bins of all different sizes um, that I, and I have that they have shelving units that go with the bins, which I have as well. And so they're the right height for them and they slide in and out and you can put, and some of them are, some of them will be a wall that has little, they have basically little tabs sticking out and so you can hang the bins on them. Um, some of them you can slide in, they're long, they're short. Um, and I find those to be really useful. The other thing that I use um, a fair bit of are, um, wall brackets, wire, uh, cable wall brackets. And these are, you'll see these in any production truck, any production location, you'll see these brackets. And what they are is they'll, you'll, they'll, you'll, they, they bolt into the wall and they just have slots. They have little teeth that stick out and you just hang your cables on them. It's a lot less stress on your cables to not be wrapped up all the time, especially if they're short. So up to about six feet, we see people just hang the cables down. And then under, over that, people start to roll them. And when you roll them, then you're using typically, um, you know, I have a, a lot of the um, pegboard and I have pegboard with little bars sticking out and then I can hang my cables onto those. So the, a mixture of the, the pegboards, the, um, the wire bracket, the, the, the cable brackets, uh, the, the bin organizers, the, the, the shell, wire shelving, uh, the, that's pretty much what I've used for maybe the last uh, decade. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I've taken to using these uh, from Iris, these Weather Pro, uh, they're uh, weather tight storage bins. Uh, they're transparent so that you can put stuff in them. They have a gasket that runs around the perimeter here, and these buckle clamps make it uh, a watertight seal. I use that for storing my uh, 3D printer filament uh, to keep it from drying out. I throw about four packs of desiccant in each one. And it's great for storing stuff because it keeps the moisture, keeps them dry. And even if your storage area, like a shed or a garage, springs a leak or something, all of your equipment will not be damaged by the water that comes in. And the fact that it's transparent, you can see what's in it without having to open it up and root through it. Jason? Boy, over the years, I've done so much of this. And since I'm in the process of moving, um, you can see behind me that the 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 hooks are, are like starting to disappear. Um, Uline shelves are excellent. Um, so excellent, in fact, that I, what I really like is you can you can take the storage unit off, wrap it with plastic, put it back on, and then wrap the whole thing like a pallet and then just put it on a truck. That's what I'm in the process of doing. Um, they, they are absolutely excellent. Um, Pelican cases, for sure, and um, be sure you get a really great labeler. Bill? So once upon a time, I would say all of the above, and he says shelves, cardboard boxes, plastic bins, plastic zip bags, toolboxes, and so forth, all of the above except cardboard boxes. I am now cardboard free, basically because I used to drag around seven boxes that were my old tax records, and every year I would put a new one up there and throw the old one away and, and shred it. But all of that is now electronic. All of my tax filings and the rest of those things are all done online, so I don't need that anymore. So cardboard just... I, even in Arizona, where it's very dry, you get a bad bout of humidity or a bad rainstorm, or you were outside and had just taken a few things out, cardboard just disintegrates in the face of moisture. And boy, when I dumped the rest of those boxes out of the shed, some of them had gotten a little damp. And I hate that you pick it up and the whole bottom falls out. No, thank you. Cardboard is a no-no for me. Um, pulling in the chat uh, was Roscoe mentions backpacks with a list of contents for the field for field gear and camera shoulder bags for his pocket 4k kit. Also, he uses soft coolers for heavy hard drives. Um, in the studio, we have um, like those big rolling like mechanics use them in the in the shop. I, the name is eluding me right now, but because we can roll it around and just have things that we're accessible, like need to pull out um, accessibly for myself as well. I use these clear bins. Um, it helps when traveling so that I can stack them well. And so when I go through TSA and I've got to pull things out, see, we're all we're all good here. Um, so those being um, two ones. And like Jason said, getting a, a really good labeler so that you can just keep yourself organized. Alex? 
Netto makeup bags are really nice to keep cables and little doodads. So I have little, they're little mesh metal bags that you can get at container store. And I put, I'll have like all my little converters in one and I'll have all of my, you know, I'll have all of my mounts on another one. And uh, container store is a great place. It's, it's like a, <laughs> certain places I just like to go, like Granger, container store. Like I just think about all the possibilities. And so that, that that's one of the ones that's there. Another one to think about is also Domke, uh, D-O-M-K-E makes these, um, per, these wraps and they are a, a slightly padded wrap that has Velcro on them. And I wrap lenses and cameras and all kinds of other stuff. If you're just going to need to put them in somewhere, it just makes it a little soft and so not banging against each other. They're not going to handle, you know, being dropped by, you know, 20 feet or something, but they are going to be something if you're packing them in and you just don't want metal against metal. Um, they, I, I've ha I have, a lot of them, <laughs> so they, they work well. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is looking at the new feature. Has anyone experimented with live performance audio in Zoom? And if so, how effective is it? Alex? Haven't tested it, but from la after last week, I did a little bit more research on it. So what this is, is not so much higher quality audio, but much lower latency audio. So it's not worried about trying to keep the audio and the video together. What it's trying to do is get the audio back and forth as fast as possible. So this would be similar to a far play kind of thing. And it's getting down to the 50 millisecond range, um, you know, for the transfer. Um, um, we haven't gotten to test it yet, but we are going to be testing it probably this week. So if you ask again next week, a couple of us are going to be playing with it just to see what it looks like and feels like and, and what that, what that actually means. Next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles. When a company wants its meetings and presentations to look as good as office hours and they're willing to do what it takes to get there, what would getting there look like? Alex? So we've done that. I mean, we've had companies that paid us to, to make it look basically like what we're seeing here. Uh, and we build kits. We have kits that are that go out. I have a kit room that is just lots of pieces of kits that we send out to folks. Um, usually what we're doing to get to look like this is is um, it's usually two lights, either um, the um, the bicolor, um, the, the 68Bs or 100Bs are the uh, NAND lights are the ones we've used in the mo most in the past. Uh, along with light stands, um, we have been using black magic cameras, although we're now kind of leaning into the Sony cameras because it's actually easier for the user. So the FX30s are, that's why I'm using one here is that we're testing that for our future kits um, because it keeps everybody in focus. Um, a lot of times we're sending them out with a teleprompter um, and uh, and then we uh, obviously have in-ear, a USB, a, a mix pre um, we send out because of the noise assist um, and the ability also limiters and so on and so forth to keep it to keep them from overmodulating. Uh, we send them out with an ATEM so that we can, um, now we've, in the past, we primarily sent the ATEM out so that we could shade the camera. So we're not doing that now, but we do usually have a Mac mini that we can control to do this. So it depends on whether you're trying to send this out as a one-off or whether you're setting people up permanently. But when we send them out, we send them out, we have a kind of a, what we call the brain, which is a 3U system that has um, a mix pre and the, and the mini and the ATEM and the power. And a, it actually has a Meraki in it that has a modem so that we can log into it no matter what. Um, and, uh, and so we have a bunch, you know, that kind of little kit that we send out. The most important piece of this, if we're sending to someone where we don't get to set it up is a very clear instructions. So a clear video, a PDF step-by-step. -step, and oftentimes we get on the a call with them and we put it together with them. And so if it's a one-off, we do it that way. If it's a, if otherwise you, you want to kind of do a consulting where you're jumping, you know, you're sending someone over to take most of those components and build them out for folks. Um, it's a, uh, you know, it, it, there are, there are a lot of companies. I think the companies wanted to see what was going to happen after, um, uh, after what, you know, the COVID ended, uh, some companies jumped right into it. Very beginning of COVID bought thousands of basic kits. Now executives want better kits because the reality is sinking in that somewhere between a third and their half of their employees aren't going to come back to the office. <laughs> and so, uh, so now they have to figure out how do we build a virtual conferencing process. And, um, and so I think that we're going to see kind of a, a, a slow surge of a, a lot of this hardware. Bill? Uh, on top of what Alex is saying, which is all every bit true to me, I think about it in terms of there's the hardware component, which is very important. There's also the understanding component. And we talk a lot about that. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks of effort to get to where I am now. And it was this process of continually understanding why doesn't this look as good as I want it to do? What can I change? Uh, you know, every setup is different because this is your space. What you're facing, is there a big window behind you? Can you get lights in? Can you afford this kind of light versus that kind of light? So it's this combination. I, I've always said it's never the piano, it's the piano player. 
And even given exactly the same hardware I have, somebody who has a different thought process as to how to put it together can get less compelling results than someone who has studied, oh, how do I change? You know, there's too much light on the left side of my face. What are my options for knocking that light down without messing up what I've already done. Mm -hmm. And that requires technique and a little bit of study and a little bit of effort. So I always think it's those two sides. The hardware is important, but the understanding of how to compose and make a picture work with all the things that a lighting background, everything that goes into that, those are the two things that actually get you toward mastery of it. Mitchell? I'd also like to add the word prioritize because prioritize the things that don't work well for the average Zoom user, uh, audio, then camera, then lighting, uh, backgrounds, the internet capability, those are important. And Alex, by the way, uh, if you're looking for a remote control for your Sony FX30, uh, the Sony remote app is pretty guard, pretty good. And there's another one called Monitor Plus, which is an app you can run on uh, an iPhone or other device. Well, someone just sent that to me I, in, in Discord. The, the, you, you should be using Monitor. Cool. I was complaining about that, so I'm going to definitely, uh, definitely play with that. the The main thing is is that I, I do think that um, you're probably looking. What you want to have them think about also is the budget of their. They're probably in to do what we do here. Not everybody here has put this kind of money into it, but. But if you, if I was going to tell a corporate company, because what you don't want to do is is try to cut corners and then have them go, well, this didn't turn out the way I expected it to. I was watching office hours, and this isn't. They they need to be kind of in the grips of five to ten grand, <laughs> like is is you know to do what most of us do here is in that ballpark. Probably five thousand is probably nip and tuck, and ten grand is about what they want to think about. Um, if, if that's what I would tell a corporate client, because you're going to remember you have consulting time in there as well, so it's not just the hardware, which can be less. But it's also consulting time, people coming in, um, they have to set it up. Uh, having them set it up by themselves is a, you know, a, uh, not going to be great. So you want to come in and build it for them. Um, what we're seeing more and more corporate companies think about is a dedicated room for executives, either a shared room, but a lot of times right next to their room. If you're paying an executive millions of dollars a year, you can give them another room. You know, like, and so they, they just build another room right next to where they are that they can just walk over and then they don't, and there are a lot of exec. I guess I would say many executives for the biggest companies, the Fortune uh, 10, may or may not have studios that are right next to their office. <laughs> they literally open a door and they walk in and they're in a studio environment. They don't necessarily want it in their office office. They want to be in their office office and they want to walk into another room that's their, their, their meeting office. Um, and it's all set up for them and all they got to do is sit down and do it. And that's a very popular thing on, in some of the largest companies you want to think about. Next question. Funshak Georgi in uh, Dharamshala, India, says, Tashi Delek, the Tibetan greeting. Oh, a Tibetan greeting from India. I have a Behringer Ultramatch Pro SRC2496, which I used for bringing in audio into an old ATEM TVS. Where else can I put it to use now? I missed the ATEM TVS, which had four SDI and four HDMI ports. Thanks. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, pay Yavadu, Fansuk. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do with this. Um, I, I, I would say any time you need to do A to D and D to A, it's going to be useful. Um, AES EBU is still used, I believe, in in current ATEMs. And so being able to switch between those two can be very handy. Courtney? Yeah, I wasn't sure whether he's trying to repurpose his, his uh, Behringer or the ATEM. The ATEM TV studio, I have one of those and the problem with that one is it's still functional works pretty well has four hdmi and four sdi and and two of them are and four of them are switchable as eight inputs uh but uh it ha all the eight inputs have to be the same frame rate so it doesn't convert doesn't frame rate convert on the inputs so if you're using you if you're setting it to 1080i for the output all your inputs have to be 1080i etc uh so there's that limitation if you're talking about the behringer yeah, what Jason said, it's a good A to D converter. Uh, it'd be handy to have to convert output uh, from a mixer or something into an optical output that you could use into a sound bar that has an optical input, for example, or an AV uh, system. Uh, it's good for doing a bi-directional A to D conversion where you can set the uh, word length and the, and the sample rate. Next question. 
Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Is there any AI technology even close to being able to run a server with a large number of websites and auto-generate and refresh content? That's an interesting question. And I guess what I'm I'm hearing from him is that just for the page to auto-refresh, is that it, Alex? Go ahead. I think it's updating the page itself. And no, not yet. It, it probably will be. I mean, you're, you're probably going to have AI agents that are going out and grabbing you information. The real problem is, is that uh, with AI agents, and look, that's what you're getting right now. Facebook is looking at, <laughs> at how you interact with content, and then it's feeding you a feed, and so is, and so is Twitter, and so is everything else. They're feeding you a feed based on your on how you interact with things right now, and then people complain about that because they're not seeing everything they want to see. So, so there's a there's a plus and minus to having it do do the what you're talking about. All right. Well, thank you so much, producers, for all your questions for our first hour, and. Let's keep them going because as I get ready to introduce Cindy Drozda, who is no, uh, while she's a guest for a second hour, she's no stranger to office hours because she's one of the many talented people behind the scenes who help to make this show flow and the way and work the way that it needs to. Cindy, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank All right, you, there Liberty. we go. <laughs> welcome to everyone. Uh, let me get over to my shop here. Oh, awesome. And uh, that was my being on the panel view there. And now I'm in the shop. So, so we're I'm looking eager forward to, eager to be here. Yeah, to this conversation, because you have been, um, well, first I wanted to start out, you have this amazing quote on your website that I wanted to to read, where it show you said, the more that we are exposed to different methods and ideas, the more we expand our own horizons. And you being in the shop, you doing wood turning, you doing this virtually, building community, and then also like the e-learning aspect, Where where did this all begin? How did all these worlds intersect for you? I think I'd have to say that wood turning is a really unique space. It's, a, it's about sharing and community and cooperation, maybe because most of the people in wood turning are hobbyists and are not trying to make a living doing this. So, so we're willing to share our methods. And the more you're exposed to the other wood turners, the more everyone grows. The more we advertise for each other as cooperative businesses, the more business everyone has. Um, yeah, community is the, is the answer to all of it, I think. And let's start, I always like to have like a baseline. So wood turning, can you define that for us, for those who may not be familiar with this space, this niche, this craft? What is wood turning? Uh, basically, the definition of wood turning is it is it's something that is made using a wood lathe. A wood lathe is what you got right here in front of me. It's a, a machine with a motor that spins a piece of wood around and chisels are taken to the spinning wood to create objects. But Wood turning as a community is people who do this for a hobby with a passion. And we have chapters to our national organization uh, worldwide and nationwide. People who get together once a month or more often to share ideas, to show what, what we're doing. Uh, people get together in each other's shops to learn. Uh, wood turning is not the kind of thing you go to college to learn very often. It's usually learned by working with someone else in your local group. And we have a, a national group as well, which is having the national symposium in about a week and a half where I will be there with a big trade show and uh, demonstrations are a big part of wood turning education and sharing where Somebody like me gets up in front of a group or virtually now uh, and shows how to do something so that they're good at. 
at what point in time did you you've you've been doing this this wood turning i also see like your you youtube channel you've got a fairly substantial youtube channel so you've been on youtube since 2009 but at what point did you decide <laughs> that you know and at 13,000 just to say like sydney is no slouch um in that space but at what point in time did you decide to add the 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 business side of it because you you're doing training and and you also have like you're you're selling the training the information the knowledge that you are also sharing with the community if you can talk through that because I, I know that our community would be really interested in that aspect yeah well i i guess i could start with how did i get into wood turning and then that naturally naturally flows to why did i make it my business everything i've ever gotten into in my life I just gravitated towards doing it for other people as a business. And wood turning, I started out just, I love making stuff. And when I wanted to become self employed, I realized that wood turning was the way that I could make things, put a price on them, and put them out there in a market. And I made my living selling the stuff I made for maybe about 10 years from. Uh, mid nineties to, uh, oh six or seven. And then it was a gradual pr progression to, but that's a business. The, the gradual progression was to a change in the business where I started getting more requests to come and teach in person. I started getting, uh, more requests for where can I buy the tools you're using? So I started making them and it evolved into where I am today, where I hardly uh, sell anything that I just made. What I'm, my business consists of making tools. That means chisels and other attachments for the wood turning world. And I do this online instruction. And that, that's what I'm most excited about because when uh, I, I started doing it before the pandemic lockdown, in about, uh, in 18, I did my first virtual presentation. And in those days, it was me here in my studio, everybody else in a room with one laptop connected to the monitor in the room and everybody's watching me on Zoom. When the lockdown hit, we all had to learn how to use Zoom and everyone was at home watching me. And that brought a level of community to wood turning that just put us light years ahead. And I know, Cindy, that you have, before we get to some of the questions with our panel, that you have a demo that you just kind of want to walk us through and, and show us. And, and if you want to give us some inside baseball, feel free to go ahead and show us some of that, that gear and equipment. Oh, I would love to show you my gear and equipment. And, and I have to say that uh, office hours, people have uh, uh, a level of video and audio expertise that is way beyond me. But when you see the primitive system I have, realize that this to wood turners is top of the line. Mm -hmm. Probably Todd Raines and I are the top quality video producers in wood turning today, at least two of at the top. And uh, so yeah, I'd love to show the, show you the tech. And I also thought I would just run through a quick little example of what I mean by showing you how to make something. And I, I've got my, my system set up where I can give you different camera views and I'll put the tool to the wood and actually do the, do the work, um, and try to put in a little bit of the multimedia stuff that I do in just a few minutes. So, um. Yeah, do you want me to do that right now? Yes, please. Okay. You see the panel so we'll all baited breath, breath waiting to see what you're going to show us. But, you know, this is really the fun part, is, is doing the stuff. And, uh, yeah, I can talk about it all day long. And I do want to talk about some of the community sharing that we do in wood turning. But here we are. I am going to show you how to make an ornament, a hanging ornament like this one. It's two parts. The, the globe, hollow globe part is made from a thing called a banksia pod, which is the fruit of a tree from Australia. This is what 
uh, the raw material looks like, um, like turning a banana or an apple, so to speak. Uh, they come in a huge number of sizes. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's not the guy I wanted to show. Somebody had a question. Where's Carter? There's yeah, Carter. That's Carter. <laughs> There's Carter, but what we're going to do is we're going to show you uh, Banksia pods come in a whole bunch of different sizes. And that's what I'm going to make this thing out of. I've prepared a little piece of it for you, and I'm going to take a chisel, and this is uh, called a bowl gouge. We'll turn the lathe on, and we're running at uh, top speed here, which is about 3,000 RPM. And I'll just clean it up, and now I'm going to make the cut where I create some shape to it. And you can see with this view what my body goes through. Once I have a little bit of shape to it, I'm going to hollow out the inside. And I've already started it with a hole. And uh, what I'm making here is a hollow globe. So it, this is hollowed out. And right now I'm going to do the hollowing part. I think we'll go for about half speed for this. And I have a tool, a special tool here that is made for hollowing out the inside of something. This is a very tiny something, and a bigger something would use a bigger variety of this same tool. So that's a little bit loud there, and what I'm what I'm doing is shaping the inside. And the reason I like to make these globes out of Banksia pods is because uh, with those holes, the natural holes, I don't have to stop the lathe to clear the chips, and I can actually maybe you can see it actually. See the tool inside the piece through the holes while I'm going. So I can judge my uh, wall thickness of my piece. Mm -hmm. Once I've got the top part of it done, I'm going to maybe do a little shaping on the other end, again with the bowl gouge. Just giving it a little more shape. I will, with the lathe running, use a piece of sandpaper. And sandpaper here. And I will slow the lathe way down for the sanding. And this is a real quick. We'll go through about six grits of sandpaper here. And then I'm, I'm going to turn it around to do the other side by putting a fixture in the lathe chuck and this fixture is cup shaped with a a tenon a stub in the middle and uh what it does is it's a cup that will contact the sides of the piece the stub tenon goes in the hole so when you see this the piece that i just turned will go in here and it kind of lodges in in the the um edge of that cup we'll get over here the edge of the cup is is a taper the shape of the, the piece is a taper, and it just jams in there. I can actually turn the lathe spindle by holding on to this piece, and it's not attached with any glue or anything at the moment. 
So that's called a jam chuck, and it's a really common wood turning technique. Now I'm going to bring up my tail stock, and I can support the piece and turn away the excess so that I end up with making my hollow globe. Wow. So I'll be shaping this top part. So that's um, that's uh, wood turning uh, instruction via video online. And I have uh, five, I think, or six cameras that have different views I can show you. Um, I can zoom in and out. I use vMix on a Windows machine and uh, 4K cameras, virtual PTZ, outputting 1080p to zoom. And then I record it at the same time in a couple of places locally so that I can then uh, edit a video that people have to watch later. And that is not what's on YouTube. My YouTubes are live streams mainly and other product support stuff. I have so many more questions, but I'm going to let Alex get his in first before I do. <laughs> First of all, that's uh, super impressive. Like, uh, you know, at first it took me a second to figure out what you were doing. Like you're, you're really small in the corner and then we're showing the close up, and, and it was just, it just worked. Like it, it's, yes. it, I could, you know, it just totally worked because I could see what you were doing. And then I had the close up there. Um, it was, now how are you, what are you using to control the cameras? Cause I can see you kind of just. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'd love to show you all of that tech. Um, it's <laughs> vMix. Right. With, um, uh, uh, virtual PTZ. Right. I have shortcuts set up for VMix keyboard shortcuts set up. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we show the tech now? Oh yeah. Oh so yeah. I'm, it's happy to hear that. Like that, Alex. That was my thing. I was like, <laughs> I, how masterful it. It, was, it, was, it was for her. The it inset. was seamless. It yes. was seamless. It was just like the seamless, like you, obviously you can see what happens when someone's doing it a lot. They have it, they've, they've refined it a fair bit. And, and we've saw, we saw this as, as well when Todd came on and, and, and showed some stuff. It's just, if you're doing yeah. it well enough and you kind of craft it together, but, but it was, it was just, it was, anyway, it was great. And Todd uses an ATEM. I use vMix. It's kind of different approaches to the same thing. But so anyway, here's the studio. And uh, we have a bunch of stuff. I can show you some close-ups of things. Um, right here, we have a, uh, where is it? This is the tech right here. But first I wanna show you the cameras. Okay, Panasonic um, G9 tethered to a pc that's over here next to me um and so you can slide that a, you can slide that camera back and forth yes it's on a slider this camera mm -hmm. it's on a pan tilt and a slider <sighs> with a remote for zoom and focus via lumix tether this is the one that looks down here so i can i can slide it back and forth physically. What, and what are you, oh, you're, but, but how, how are you, what, what are you doing to control it to go back and forth? Um, right here. I, I never thought we'd, we'd uh, have this magic in front of Alex and he'd be flabbergasted. <laughs> she said <laughs> low tech. This is really cool. She said low tech. She said low tech. And then she's just like, boom. You know, like, it was just I'm, like, whoa. I'm, I'm just so so I've here. got, <laughs> I've got a stream deck and that's for comms and a couple of other things with um, Vicrio listener. This is the main control panel. It's just a mini keyboard and I'm using vMix keyboard shortcuts. You can have one key do three or four things at a time if you want to. Right. Uh, joystick for so that's controlling virtual the PTV. That is one way of controlling the camera. Like mm. for instance, this camera, which is an uh, RX100 model seven, I'm going to use virtual PTZ with the joystick and now I can move it. Oh this is not physically moving the camera. This right. is just moving the image around. Zoom in digitally and then I can move to a different area of interest in the image. This one now is actually moving the camera. 
And you're, and you're using the joystick and for tilt. that? Is that is that what's the? No, that's not the joystick. Here's where we are now. The joystick did the virtual PTZ. Right. Now I have a pan tilt mechanism here, controller here. Uh-huh. I have the slider control here. And what and are those? I what are those con- that, is, that a, is, that, is that the slider control that came with the slider? And yeah, it's up. the oh, slider okay, it. mechanism, it's a Canova, and it, right. it's, it's wired up to right, there. Right, right. And, and I just, it's an Ethernet cable, actually, to the control for the slider. The pan tilt is, um, I don't know what sort of connection it is, just a cable. Right. And it, it's, a, it's a, let's see, here it is up here, right? There it is. So the pan tilt thing is a device that's mounted to the slider, camera mounts to it. So when I move the slider, I'm moving the camera and pan tilt. And I've got that camera also connected to HDMI to get into vMix. And it's got the remote and it's got Lumix Tether. So you have wires all over the place. It's so good. <laughs> and let's see, what else have we got over here? Uh, We've got it's Christmas in May. Uh, little <laughs> little remotes, and if you look here, I've got little remotes. I, I can see that when you I said it was state of the art. I was like, okay, well, we'll see. It's because she's got a couple cameras that might be state of the art, and then this is yeah. state of the art. Like this is like this is amazing. Like, I it, I started with a couple of of Logitech webcams. Right, right, right. But so what I have here now is this is. Let me see if my video pencil is working. This one here is a Sony RX100 Model 7, and, and it has a Bluetooth remote that I can zoom and focus with. The video uh, pencil is not coming through. Not, uh, it's not? Okay, sorry. Thank Thanks, you, Todd. Todd. See, um, when I go. do these presentations, Todd is my back end <laughs> for things like that. Uh, that would have normally been said on comms, by the way. Yes, right. We have uh, Unity comms and... And comms in, in one ear and zoom in the other sometimes. So this camera is the one that I did. I showed you the virtual PTZ. Now over here, I have another one, RX100 Model 7. And that's that view that's like over my shoulder here so that you can get rid of that. You can see how my arm moves and how the tool goes across the wood and um, over way over, uh, where is it, off to, let's get you back into the right place. Over here is another RX100 Model 7 with the Bluetooth remote and everything that's doing a view, I call it the headstock view, and that looks this way, so you can see me do stuff over here, you can see me do stuff like with the chalk over here, and it's useful for some productions. Uh, I will be generally setting up for each project with the camera's different views and zoomed out to a certain place for the size and the difficulty or what a hardware I'm using. If I'm doing a larger hollow form like this, then I've got all kinds of other apparatus uh, that I need to get in the picture. Right. Okay. Oh, and over my shoulder, giving us this view, is an Avaya huddle camera. And it's got right. uh, a remote right here that will give me areas of interest. Right now, it's all the way zoomed out. You can zoom it in. And, and even with all this yeah. tech, Cindy, like your ability to seamlessly, like you are using heavy machinery, but then also being able to maintain eye contact. I see that you've got the monitor in front of you and then mm. teaching through that. How long did it take for you to, for that to come together for you? Uh, well, I, it, it started, I guess, I've been doing presentations like this without the video stuff for 24 years or something. I think I did my first one in 98. And uh, through that, I'm presenting to an audience in their facility with the lathe and I'm learning how to make something 
talk at the same time and we have a camera operator using a camera probably in the wrong place most of the time but my job is to try to get the camera to show what i need to show to tell the story and talk to the audience talking while you're turning is important i didn't today because of the audio but Usually I'll keep a running conversation about what I'm doing at every moment. So the transition to video then was not that difficult for me, but it has meant adding another dimension because now I am thinking switch to the camera. I'm thinking I'm about to do this thing here. I want to show you this view of it. Oh, and then I want to show you the tool over here in this view and, and look at it in detail and maybe i want to show you some measurements of something and i'm going to zoom out a bit so that i can show you how i measured something and get over here and you know so i'm, I'm learning how to make the story be part of the the video be part of telling the story because they can't see me in person Right. And I think I can do a way better job this way than I ever could in person. Uh, oh. Also, you'll have to know that I rehearse, I practice and practice and practice. And I spent all day yesterday setting this up for this presentation. Outstanding. And, yeah. Outstanding. We can tell Todd, you've got a question. Well, it's just more, more, not really comment, uh, more a question, uh, more a comment than a question. Uh, you know, Cindy talked about, you know, building the community and, and uh, you know, my path to getting to virtual was kind of similar. She started before the pandemic. I started when the pandemic hit and, uh, you know, getting that sort of uh, direct connection, you know, staring at the camera and that's the audience that's sitting out in front of you, basically, uh, it takes a lot of practice and stuff. And it's it's a it's a growth. When I did my office hour, second hour, year and a bit ago. Um, you know, my, my studio has changed a lot since then, mm -hmm. you know, new cameras, um, you know, I control my ATEM with stream deck, um, and then a few other controls for, for zoom and focus and stuff, but it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey. I think, uh, Cindy, as she said, is, uh, the two of us are kind of, you know, kind of the remaining sort of high end productions of wood turners left. There's still plenty of people doing virtual um productions across the world uh ireland has got a great couple of guys doing some uh um you know video production and, and live production stuff um and then there's a few across the us and a couple in, in australia that are pretty good so um it's a it's a global community now uh, my demo on saturday had people from sao paulo brazil and uh from austria and uh, across canada us and hawaii uh, so, and Cindy reaches many, many more people than I do, but, uh, it's a, it's a great community. It's uh it's amazing how I've met more people in the last three years than I had in my previous 20 years in wood turning. So Courtney and gotten closer oh, go to them. Go ahead. Uh, just to finish out the tech there, that the front view that you showed us there, the rest of that shop is a still that's being keyed in. Is that correct? Or is it actually there? Uh, you mean you this view here? Yeah, yes. This view right here? Uh, when you saw me on the panel, I have a green screen behind me. That was this view here. I have a green screen behind me. And so what you're seeing right now actually is behind me, but that's a picture of it. I see. That, yeah. So you've I got the green screen the is green between screen you. I see. Between you and, and the what's the really there. Uh -huh. And so that is so that when I'm showing you something, I can have me in the corner so that when my hands aren't in the picture, you see what I'm doing with the machine or that I'm moving around or, or whatever. And so that's to give you the reality view. If you were watching me in person, you would, you would be watching the action on the monitor. Mm -hmm. And you would see me in front of you at the same time. So out of the corner of your eye, you're seeing what the person does. And I'm trying to simulate that by putting the green screened out me oh, in the corner here. I think it's without great. the green screen, it's it's a great big distracting background. Right. 
No, it's a high quality key uh, and you look great. We would never know you're. You say that and I'm just so thrilled to hear it because I have struggled with the key over and so much over again. Uh, Yeah, this is just vMix chroma key. I tried all kinds of other things and today it's working. I'll take it. Alex? Yeah, I was going to, you know, I was going to ask at first what, whether you thought you'd do a better job at home, because that's what I feel like when I'm presenting at home, I have a better, I have better tools. <laughs> a thousand the, times better. I yeah. have the tools. I have the cameras that I am switching that I set up right. more of them. And I can use, uh, usually when I go in, in person, I have a hundred pounds of bags, two 50 pound check bags. That's all the stuff I can carry. I'm using yeah. somebody else's lathe, somebody else's, yeah. a lot of the machinery, uh, I can do a far better job at home. And does any, do you ever have it where it's Todd or someone else running all those cameras for you? Or do you prefer to do it yourself so that you could just focus on, you, 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 you want to be the one cutting the, cutting the angles? Well, I, I do. I want to cut the show myself because I know what's about to happen next. And I know in my head what view I think the yeah. audience needs to see to show that. Uh, what I do have, though, is Todd is the back end. Um, managing participants on zoom things like that and when i do it for a club i have one of their people be my co-host and semi run the back end but on the zoom meeting i've got a monitor right here that i put the chat on and i can look up and see the chat just like looking up to see my multi-view and answer questions on the fly pretty well have, if and, I miss one, Todd tells me about it. And, and you and Todd may be way past me on this one, but have you guys thought about like building like a little studio so you have like a conference where there's like wood turner after wood turner after wood turner coming on to show things, but you have a whole studio built for them so they don't have to know how to do any of these things. But as a, because the only people that could cut a wood turning thing like that would be another wood turner. Like, like you'd right. be the only, and you and Todd would be the only ones that could actually do it. What you're talking about is possibly the future of this because right now, there, oh, when the pandemic started, and I, I could tell you some more pandemic uh, success stories there too, but that was when most people got into this, yeah. bought cameras, figured out how to use them. Not everyone wants to go to the tech length, uh, or the equipment tech, or the, the physical learning part of it, but they might be very good at doing a demo. So my my feeling is that someday that will happen where there's a studio set up and people come in and, and do their demo. Uh, some of the clubs are doing that already where they have a, they have a, but their setup doesn't uh, look like yours and Todd's. No. Well, it could. It Why could. not? No, no, it could. it could. No, no, I'm saying that that, but, but the, it seems like the two of you are on the, you know, kind of on the cusp of something that's really, and one of the reasons that I'm so interested in this is, is, is I, well, number one is, uh, in shop, the lathe, both the metal lathe and the and the wood lathe were my favorite. Like I mm. always wanted to figure out how I can make a living doing that, and I couldn't figure it out. So here's what I do now. <laughs> so so anyway, but it's just they're beautiful machines. And um, but the other thing is, is that there are so many things like this. These are skills. These are it's an art form. And um, being able to see an artist do it and be able to cut to those different angles in a way that you couldn't even do if you were in the room. And then being able to answer mm-hmm. questions, I think, is just is one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on um, uh, and to really ta- dig into this. Because it's not, I think, what you're doing is applicable to thousands of other things um, oh, of, yeah. of, of figuring this out. Yeah. And what, what we're doing has so many implications for the future, possibilities, yeah. paths to go down for the future. Uh, we're kind of just scratching the surface. Oh, yeah. And... People like Todd and I are trying to stay on the cutting edge of it technology wise. I don't need to have 4K cameras to wow the wood turners. They're content with a crappy looking webcam that flickers every now and then and a camera that you have to go move it real shakily to get it to the right place for the mm-hmm. next shot. And, you know, uh, but I, I want to do the best I can do. Yeah. That's what makes it fun for me. And we'll, we'll be having the show cut by somebody else. Hey, we might have the show cut by somebody who's in another country like you guys do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Todd. Uh, yeah. I was just going to uh, kind of chime in a little bit. So I do uh, co-host uh, Cindy's demos, uh, you know, individual sort of personal demos, if you will. Um, 
and uh, we have started integrating uh, graphics. So from my end, uh, John Barker started uh, GFX Live, which is over the internet web-based graphics. I use his HDR graphics in my own production, um, but the GFX allows me to control graphics that show up on her end. So we've done a little bit of that um, where I can control the graphics from this end uh, on her output. So uh, that is just starting to happen in the last uh, two months or so. Uh, we've talked about you know, getting a VPN between us to, uh, to be able to maybe control. Uh, but as she said, as Cindy said, uh, she knows when she wants to cut the camera to this view same thing from my perspective in my shop in my studio. It's uh, it's where I know where I'm going to go next. So I know, okay, that button and, and go. And so it, it'd be, you're right, Alex, it, it has to be another wood turner the, to cut a show like this to know exactly what's going to happen, but it would have to be rehearsed a little bit. Um, it's one thing, uh, clubs across the country, I don't know how many chapters there are, a couple hundred chapters. 360. 360. So, and 90, well, I guess the 70% of those clubs have an AV system, a couple of, you know, cameras, uh, monitors, or, you know, projectors to show the audience what's happening um, at the, uh, at the demo that's happening that month. But 90% of those operating the cameras are watching the demo and not mm -hmm. switching. And so there's always it's always just a poor performance in terms of camera switching at a demo and that's something that we've uh, developed as performers uh and this is where if you had a studio uh like ours and you brought other turners in sure you could cut the show very nice but if that person is not a great performer then it doesn't really translate that that well and that's something i think cindy has learned and i have learned over the last three years is um not necessarily a verbal diarrhea, but we want the conversation to continue and not just be there silent in 20 minutes turning. We want to explain what we're doing right. and, and stuff like that. So it takes a lot of practice uh, to look at this camera, know it's the audience and tell them exactly what you're doing every step of the way. And the people want to know that. They'll ask you, well, what are you doing right now? And how? Mm -hmm. why are you doing that? And what tool are you using? What speed's the lathe going? All that kind of well, stuff. It, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and that could be the kind of thing that you, you and you and talk to be the hosts, you know, like asking those questions for the audience and then let the audience keep on asking questions as well. But I know well, there are, there are mind. productions that are done that way where there's a facilitator and they ask questions and the audience will ask a question and then the facilitator, yeah. the moderator will ask it. Uh, I wanted to talk a little more about the studio and the wood turner who's not operating the cameras. I could be there saying camera one, please camera two, please. And in that way, kind of cut my own show, even though someone else was doing the switching. Um, because it's hard to be intuitive. But what we've had so far is amateur videographers who are pointing a camera that's not really giving a very good view of the action. I think that's changing. The pandemic brought it about. Now, all of these clubs have hybrid meetings, we call it where there are people in the room because they insist on gathering together despite what might be better done from their homes, they want to interact. And then there are people who can't make it to the meetings, can't drive at night, don't want to live far away, live in another country, whatever it is. And those people want Zoom. So working out the audio and getting video that's good now because somebody's really demanding it the zoom people are it's changing the club's uh quality too i think this has been outstanding and there are so many questions so for our producers please this is definitely one of those shows that your votes matter to the questions that we'll be able to get through with cindy and bill let's dive straight into them Cindy, I just want you to know, in your honor, if I ever do a band, I'm calling it Jam Chuck. This has been fabulous. All right. <laughs> First question, Todd Rains from Allen, Texas. Cindy, can you tell us what other careers, trades, or training you've had? Um, yeah, I started my woodworking career at age 19 at a player piano factory. I learned on the job. The guy there was ha did it as a hobby. He had machinery of all kinds, metalworking, um, brazing, plastics, 
and woodworking. And he let me come in after hours and on lunch break and teach myself how to use the equipment. And that's where I learned how to be a woodworker. For the most part, my training has been on the job. I went on to be a cabinet maker for a living for the next, I don't know how long, picked up wood turning along the way. I also uh, had a bout of insanity, thinking I could possibly make a living rebuilding airplanes. No, you can't make a living doing that. Um, I, uh, I have gotten instruction from people along the way. I would say I'm not self-taught, but I have sought out the instruction for the things I needed, not formally. Uh, yeah. Todd? Uh, and let's not forget your uh, hang gliding prowess, right? Your uh, world-class well, hang gliding. Well, hang gliding was not a career. No, but it's It training. was a hobby. Yep. Uh, well, it's, it's something, yes. I did fly hang gliders very passionately for about 20 years. And here's, here's the aspect of business there is I just naturally fell into making equipment for people. And I had a little uh, non-profitable business, unprofitable business, uh, making harnesses and bags and packs and things and stuff for hang gliding and doing repairs, extensive ones, sometimes in the field, um, on the gliders. So, yeah, I, I guess that was part of a uh, career. P part of the journey, part of the journey. Next question. Certainly that. Next up, Chad Lafarge in Columbia. What safety practices have you implemented to accommodate all this gear? Wires can be very dangerous. Um, well, the wires are kept away. I have wireless headset, wireless microphone. The wire from the mic itself to the the transmitter is underneath this jacket, and I always wear the jacket. Uh, I do have to be careful, like I have a little light here that I'll put to look into the piece, and I have to be careful how I wrap the wire, conscious of that. But, um, yeah, my latest for the, for the wires is I've got everything pretty much. Look at how clean this wiring is. There, it's all in this cabinet now. Mm -hmm. That was last week. Before <laughs> that, I had... I had Charlotte's Web everywhere around here, but not at the rotating part. Yeah, uh, that's where my 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 setup is at. I've got uh, wires going everywhere, but the rotating parts at the end of the headstock and and in between the tailstock and headstock. So, um, you know, it's not so bad. It's just making sure that you don't get caught up in it. Right. Uh, Next question. And, oh, and sorry, safety Sydney. practices, eye protection. Good call. Definitely. The next question comes from Douglas Carmichael. Have you ever had EMI or RFI issues with audio video equipment in an industrial environment? I'm afraid my ignorance is going to show here. I do not know what EMI or RFI is. Sorry. So electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference. So have your audio or video lines ever had hash or something like that because of the signals that are bouncing around in your shop? I don't know. Sometimes we have weird things happen. And usually it comes down to vMix or Zoom acting funny. Uh, now that I have all the fans in that cabinet over there, the noise floor is much lower right here. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. What are some ways someone can try out turning if they aren't sure they want to invest in a whole lathe and tool? set up join a club join their hands-on sessions where the equipment is provided i highly recommend that versus going out and buying your stuff because you don't know whether you'll like it and you don't know what gear to buy always consult with people that are already into the craft before you buy any gear and Sydney, this is actually a great point where the community aspect of things like mm. it, how uh, it sounds like it's very a very open and welcoming community so uh, inviting people in like what does that process look like for outreach how would someone well, i would I'm, I'm excited to talk about that before the zoom era bz i guess we're gonna have to start saying uh there were the 360 clubs in the u.s and many many more worldwide 
And these are groups of people who welcome any newcomer. And uh, the clubs are the sharing of information and how can I learn how to do this? And what equipment can I buy? So that's a very welcoming community. We have symposiums, national and regional, where people gather to share ideas. Uh, since the Zoom era, now I, I'd like to talk about what, what I'm doing and what some other people are doing with community. Uh, Todd and I both, now I have to say, as far as tech goes, I've learned a lot from Todd. I've learned almost everything I do from either Alan Zenreich or Todd or office hours indirectly because Todd heard it on office hours and told me about it. And so uh, the, the live streaming that we both do now through StreamYard is broadcast to up to eight destinations. Usually we use three or four of them. It uh, gets people coming in to watch us. Um, and I think I put a link in Discord. If anybody wants to come to my one coming up this Thursday, Todd does them every other Friday. I do them every other Thursday on alternating weeks. So we tell the audience, you can see one or the other of us every week. And uh, another thing that I do with Todd as moderator is I call it a sharing session. And that's a Zoom meeting, live cameras, it's free. Uh, if you're on my mailing list, emailing list, I send you the link. And it's where we invite people to share pieces of their work. And usually they've got the virtual background and they hold it up and you can't see a thing and the lighting is terrible and the camera's up their nose. And it's fun though. It's people sharing ideas and the rest of the audience will ask questions about it. How did you do that? What finish did you use? What kind of wood is that? Sometimes someone will present something. Any ideas on how I could do this better? And those sessions come out with so many great sharing of ideas from people around the world just getting together over wood turning. So th those are those are post Zoom era things that are being done. And I'm excited about that. Next question. Dirk Brewer coming in all the way from Guatemala says, how do you keep your work area so clean? All the dust and pieces of wood go flying in his work area where you have various equipment and specialized cameras. Uh, well, what it remains to be seen whether my cameras will have shorter lifespans or, or whatever, because they do get covered with dust. If you took a look at the, I started with laptops just sitting right there in front of me. Now I have one laptop off to the side for Lumix Tether and it has a plastic protector over the screen and a plastic protector over the keyboard. And I really don't use the keyboard. I use a little remote keyboard. Uh, the other one, the lid's closed and it's in a cabinet. Uh, the cameras get covered with dust. After every session, I take my um, air gun and I blow everything off and I sweep up. And I think probably the dust will take a toll on the equipment, unfortunately. Bill? Well, I, I think she might have just answered my question. Uh, it was about how do you keep camera lenses and things like that in an environment where you're sanding and obviously there's wood dust everywhere. How often do you have to do that? Is that an every time you finish a session, you have to go in and use the air gun to blow off everything and clean it up? I do that because I want it to be a, a tidy workspace for me. Um, I'll blow off the cameras. I also have a UV filter over the lens, just a clear one in case some glitch gets thrown. But in general, the cameras are out of the firing line. The firing line is right here. I used to have a computer in front of me with the screen open and it would get covered with crud, you know, finishing products, sanding dust, CA glue. Now I have them all off to the side and the cameras are not in the firing line, but the cloud of dust settles on them. Uh, and the computer with all its fans going, if you go and blow out the computer, it's just a cloud coming out of it. Uh, so maybe that's why I have to replace my computer every year and a half to two years. Todd. Uh, yeah, just to uh, kind of echo uh, what Cindy said, uh, dust is inevitable. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, every wood shop typically has an air compressor and you use your 
air compressor and gently blow off uh, all the cameras and I'll gently blow off the, the lenses. Uh, I learned uh, the uh, clear UV filter cover from, from office hours. So I bought four mm. or five of them for my cameras. Mm. Uh, great idea. Uh, rather than replacing the lens, replace the filter. So, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'm blowing out uh, the, you know, the fan ports on the studio camera, a little cloud dust comes out, you know, everything. So it's just the world we live in and we deal with it. And uh, so far, you know, three, three years of doing this, I haven't had a camera fail yet. So, well, I have had some things fail, like the little keyboard, mini keyboards, I guess mm -hmm. they get clogged with dust. I've had to buy new ones. I've, I've blown out the control all that control panel stuff I showed you, I've blown out those controllers sometimes. I just had my first camera failure, uh, RX100 Model 7. I had it off for repair for $420. Not bad for almost five years of messing around with this stuff. So I was uncertain at the beginning how the equipment would hold up. And so far, not bad. Next question. Lenny Nelson's up next from San Antonio, Texas. Have you ever tried any sh slow motion or instant replay techniques for additional insider context? Uh, what I offer for that is a replay, a video recording that they can play back over and over again. But no, I really haven't. Uh, that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? I think vMix has an instant replay feature. More stuff to play around with. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Cindy, Cindy, you mentioned that the majority of wood turners are hobbyists. How have you been able to develop a business in such a niche hobby space? And how long did this take to develop? Uh, um, how long did it take to develop? I guess it, I don't know. Am I done? Uh, I don't know. I've been working at it for 20 years. Um, hobbyists sometimes have money to spend. Our our community is largely people who are retired. They have some kind of income because they're working life. The person who's retired now had a decent job and possibly a pension. They spend a certain amount of money on what they love to do. And in, it has become a good enough business. Yeah. Uh, I think the virtual instruction now is really changing a lot there because for $20, they can come and watch me for four hours, get a video to watch for six months of the replay and a follow-up sharing session. Whereas they would have to spend a couple of hundred plus hotel and all to go to a symposium to be able to see not even as good of a presentation. And Cindy, where did you come up with the like that the strategy of was it just because this is way the way a lot of online you see with online courses or because you have an expiry date on yours, which I think is brilliant. So I'm just curious from that 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 business side of things. Um, you mean uh, that it's only for six months? Well, I, I guess I'm just seat of the pants gut feeling about a lot of that. And I haven't really watched a lot of other online courses, so I should, you know, I should learn more from other other craft media. Uh, it's been an evolution. Some of it is what do people ask for? What are other people doing? Um, I was reluctant to just let people have a download file on their machine of my production. So I host them on Vimeo and they have access for six months. That's just how I've done it. Awesome. Next question. Lenny Nelson in San Antonio. I've lost countless hours hypnotized by wood turning videos. Is there a magic time lapse frame rate? I don't know. It I just go with what we have. And it might be some ASMR in, in that as well of just like how that, what that does sensory wise, but Todd might want to add some more to this. Uh, you, you know, I've watched countless YouTube videos of wood turning as well. Uh, sometimes I'll put it at one and a half speed, uh, but from a, from a recording point of view or our production point of view, uh, you know, I'm outputting 1080p 30 uh, as my standard. So, and then, uh, you know, the, the replays are, our 1080p quality. Uh, so however you want to, you know, spin up the player up to you. 
I think Nick. that that it is mesmerizing to watch somebody make something. And wood turning has an appeal to both the maker and the viewer where you're kind of dancing with the machine and you're moving this chisel and you're watching a shape appear underneath it. And that is mesmerizing and magical. Next question. Next one comes to us from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Can it be safe, done safely enough for a blind person to turn a bowl? Might this actually be an advantage? And what about children? Um, uh, there are a number of blind wood turners. Blind can be various levels of sighted. There's one guy whose name is uh, Michael Blankenship, and he is totally blind. And he learned how to turn after he lost his sight. By feel, uh, I think he has his wife around most of the time to make sure there isn't some flying object around that he doesn't see. Uh, but it's very sensory. And yes, it can be done safely by blind people and people with other physical limitations. At our national symposium, there's a wood turning with physical limitations conference going on. Children, um, yes. It can be done as safely for children as any shop class type of thing can be, maybe safer, because really the cutting edges are not moving. Only the wood is moving. So there are people who teach classes for children and uh, schools that have wood turning in their shop class sometimes. I haven't done it. Todd? Todd? Uh, yeah, it, Cindy covered pretty much everything um, that I was going to mention, except that I taught my daughter, uh, started wood turning uh, with her when she was 10 or 11. And so she grew up doing it a little bit for a few years. When she got old enough to drive on her own in high school, uh, she became my wood hunter. So mm. she would see a tree down and say, hey, Dad, there's a wood tree down over here. So teach your children young if you're a wood turner <laughs> to find wood for you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Next question. Ah, uh, John Snyder, Reno, Nevada. How do you teach students to see the object in the wood and how to understand which bits to chip away to reveal it, a la Michelangelo? Ah, that is one of my focuses. And what I will do is create graphics of the blank you're starting with and the shape inside it. I will show them how to manipulate the chisel to create the cut and the shape. Making the shape is one thing. Making the shape really look good is another develop your eye as an artist kind of a skill that can be learned. And my mission is to teach people that. Next question. Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Have you considered for self-cutting multicam the use of a multi-switch foot pedal to allow you not to have to push buttons by hand? I've considered a foot switch and there's one made by Elgato, I believe, and it has like three positions. And I've got, I think I narrowed it down to 32 keys would work for me. So, so far I haven't seen one extensive enough to replace my mini keyboard. Next question. Next one comes to us from Jason Bache in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What would be involved to add a HUD, a heads-up display, to show the lays, lathe RPMs superimposed over your top shot down? Uh, lathe RPM is irrelevant, but I get your meaning that there might be things I want to see in front of me. Uh, I would have to learn some tech to know even how to do an H heads-up display. So... Yeah, when that technology gets within my realm, um, I'm sure I'll find a use for it. And Jason, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so uh, as I was waiting, th there is a photo laser tachometer that will just do this and it will output that. So even if it's irrelevant, I feel like people tend to get hung up on on numbers and details. I, I'm sure it is irrelevant to some, you know, but I, what I was picturing is this little laser, um, you know, tachometer that's just measuring the spin at all times. And I feel like if you got the exposure right, you could actually just see it right on your top down shot. It wouldn't actually need to be superimposed. Actually, you, you mean see it on the on the video output? Yeah, yes. that would be useful. But you know, I'm trying to train people away from that. What's the speed right now? I want to teach them that the, the number is not meaningful. Is it a safe speed? Is the tool cutting 
properly? Is it vibrating all over the place and scaring you to death? Is, you know, I want to, people are always asking, what speed are you turning right now? So I put that information in a lot, but I'll usually say half speed or around this. I don't say 1325 and a half RPM. And often people will ask me and I'll say, I don't want you to focus on the number. I want you to think about what would be the safe speed for this object right now. So, uh, yeah, uh, information like that put in a, an overlay on the video could be really good. I don't know if RPM is what I would put on there because I'm trying to train people away from it. But, yeah. Makes sense. Todd. Uh, yeah, so it has been done. Uh, Theo Haralampu in Australia uh, has a little picture-in-picture -picture of his RPM up in the top corner of his videos. Oh, that uh, would be the low-tech way. Just have yeah. a camera on he your RPM camera, meter on the on, lathe. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, yeah, mm -hmm. Cindy said, not, no, not always necessary. And our last question. And we're going right back to Todd Raines from Allen, Texas. Can you talk about your path to doing virtual demonstrations? Oh, yes, I would love to talk about that, too. We could spend another whole hour. Um, Alan Zenreich had a dream that wood turning could be done from our own shops. He's He's got a lot of video and photography experience and audio, too, and all that. And he cornered me in about uh, 2016, and he started working away at me until he convinced me that this was a good thing. And it didn't take much convincing. I could see the the value in it. And he worked with me for uh, two or so years. And I still call him up and we work out details. And uh, so I guess I can give Alan a lot of credit, but the pandemic transformed my business from an occasional virtual demo and a lot of traveling to nothing but virtual demos and a successful enough business that I'm not scraping the bottom of the barrel in my checking account all the time anymore. And that, uh, I'll, I'll just give it a quick story. On March 10th, after the lockdown in Seattle, I was scheduled to do a virtual demo for one of the Seattle wood turning clubs. And a week before they, they called me up and said, Hey, we're going to have to cancel our club meeting site is, is closed. And I said, yeah, well, listen to this. Y'all can be at home and watch it on Zoom, each one of you, because I had had this idea already that I could, I could teach to uh, a group of people that were just on Zoom. One at a time doesn't even have to be a club. And it took me about 10 phone calls and emails. And I finally said, look, I'll do it for free. And that was that was the moment that transformed wood turning because a lot of other clubs heard about it and we had a few other club program directors in the audience and then the whole community it's a small community the whole community heard about it and suddenly every one of these clubs whose meeting places were shut down was looking for a virtual demonstrator and that was when that was when todd got into it i think near about that time and um uh, it it's changed a bit but that was the turning point. Cindy, thank you so much for for being you, <laughs> first of all, and really showing like you epitomize what office hours and what we do here because you have not only taken what you're from a skill set to your passion to building community around it. And you said something really powerful earlier of like you that business question, you were like, well, I don't know. I just ask what people want. So you are able to find out what your audience wants and serve them at the highest level. So uh, just a reminder to everyone to check your emails because there's links to her website and then also YouTube. And Todd, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you more on the panel as well. And Cindy, I, Cindy, I want to give you like just anything else that you want to just share with us as a closing remarks as we close out. Uh, well, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, to Josh and Alex and Liberty and everyone on the panel today and uh, office hours in general for being welcoming. I have learned so much from my involvement in office hours and after hours and asking questions as, as a producer and um, 
it has, it's a tremendous thing we have here. This is the kind of sharing that wood turning does as well. And let's keep it going because what I always like to tell the wood turners is when we share all, we all grow. So I'll leave you with that one. Outstanding. Producers, thank you so much for your questions. Panelists, for your answers and responses. Our back end team, for without which this would not be possible. I do want to let everyone know that tomorrow we'll be talking with Alan Hawks on subdivision surfaces. And if you want to learn more about what's happening all week, head over to officehours.global. Also, today we traveled 53,892 miles. That is 86 thousand seven hundred and thirty kilometers that's more than 426 million bananas 2.2 times around the earth remember you can also head into after hours with us in a moment so we'll see you soon bye cindy if this is regular applause i'm going out of the top of the frame that's my standing ovation that's right well done yeah, totally thank you thank you everyone so amazing this was this was cool i'm trying to figure out what part of Oh, yes, Alex. They don't take up much room, and they have small ones. How much? How much? What's the? How much should I budget for my first lathe? <laughs> Ask me later. But <laughs> mine cost about ten grand. I don't. I can't afford ten grand right now. <laughs> a good little one, uh, a thousand, let's say. Okay. And and the size of a sewing machine. You'll find room for it. Just big enough to turn up and down. So just a bit. Oh, turning pants. That's something. Turning, little, little matches. Just modify a bicycle and pedal real fast. <gasps> there it is. <laughs> it's what turning. It's exercise. <laughs>